Hi, Jim. How are you doing? Very fine, Denise. That's good. So we're going to start at the beginning. So when and where were you born? Well, my parents moved to Tucson because my dad was aviation mechanic. And they moved here in 51, and I was born in 52. And when I was born, my parents lived at the Consolidated Aircraft Dwellings, uh, apartment 118, where it is now Rodeo Park at Irvington and Nogal Highway or South Sixth. So then your father moved specifically for the job at the Consolidated Aircraft? Correct. My father went to aviation school in Globe, Arizona, and they moved from Globe to Tucson because my dad had gotten a job at Consolidated. Mm -hmm. And so then you automatically started living in Southside Tucson then? I was born there. Uh -huh. And were you born in your home or were you born in a hospital? I was born at St. Mary's. Okay. And uh, where did you go to school? Well, when I was two years old, we bought a brand new house on Milton, 900 block of Milton by Mission Manor School. So I started school in first grade at, at uh, Mission Manor School. And then around uh, when I was in fifth grade, we had won a burro, a little donkey. And he was about the size of a medium-sized dog when he was just a little burro. He got bigger and bigger and bigger. So my dad said, I think we have to move to the country. So that's when we moved south of town down the Gals Highway off the Old Gals Road. But I continued, then I went to school at Sunnyside Elementary at Valencia and the Gals Highway. And did you graduate, uh, did you go into high school in Sunnyside High School? And I went to junior high school right there at uh, the Gals Highway in Valencia, right at the end of the airport runway. And then high school, I went to Sunnyside. And how was it growing up? How was your childhood in Southside Tucson? It was great. Now, when I lived in Mission Manor, the freeway wasn't there yet. So we had the big, on the end of the street, we had all the desert to play in. And it was, it was, it was paradise, you know, for kids playing the Santa Cruz River and floating, getting in trouble all the time, floating down the river and going across to Midvale Farms and stealing pecans from the pecan trees and, you know, getting chased out of there by the farmer. And it was a great time. And so at that time then, um, South, how you're mentioning Southside Tucson wasn't as developed as it is now. No, and when we, for the first couple of years we lived in Mission Manor, it was actually still county. And we were on septic tanks and, you know, and uh, probably when I was about five, four or five years old, they annexed it and they put in a sewer system. So and then they, I got in trouble climbing through the, the trenches. I was always in trouble. And so there was like small private water companies then, I imagine. There was several different, I think the one that we had water from when I was a kid was Ray, Ray Water Company. But there were several, you know, and every neighborhood seemed to have its own little water company. And can you talk to me a little bit about the demographics of Southside Tucson at that time? I'd say it was about 50-50. Hispanic and Anglo, about 50-50. And so there, were there a lot of people moving into the area uh, because it was becoming developed, because of the industries that were growing in the? Well, the, the airport was a large employer, and then there was a lot of people on my street uh, worked at Hughes Aircraft. There was, I knew a lot of people, or neighbor kids that, whose parents worked at, father usually worked at the, uh, at Hughes Plant. And can you tell me a little bit about the history of your father and working in those industries? Well, as I said, he worked at Consolidated and uh, Grand Central and Douglas Aircraft. And for a while they were, during the 50s, he worked at, uh, let's see, I think they were modifying first B-47s, then the b B-29s was the, I guess the, he worked on a lot of the B-29s projects. And then they were, uh, Douglas Aircraft was, came in and they were modifying DC-6s and DC-7s. And then after the DC-6s and DC-7s, my father, uh, or Douglas, started a training on, in Tucson, training NATO troops, U.S. and, and NATO troops 
on our first ICBM rocket or missile, which was the Thor. And so he was an instructor for Douglas Aircraft, and they had the missiles and uh, the missiles were on big trailers. There were a couple of you know, support trailers and the missile trailer. They were mobile missiles. And they were located in hangar number one, on the north half of hangar number one. And in the mezzanine section, between hangar one and hangar two, is where they had the classrooms. And then years later, uh, in moving up to 1970, 69, 1970, when Pima College was first opening their first semester, they hadn't finished or hadn't completed the building of the West Campus on Anklam Road, so they used those old classrooms from the mid-50s uh, to hold their first semester in. Wow, and then, and, and that was obviously as they were building that South Side, like you mentioned, the South Campus. Well, that was Pima the West Co Campus. That oh, was, okay. uh, they, yeah, the West Campus was not quite done yet, oh. so the first semester was held at, at the hangars. Okay, and then uh, when you graduated from high school, did you move um, to another residence or did you stay there in Southside Tucson? Well, I graduated high school in 1970. And in 1970 was the year that my father started a aluminum and steel fabrication business located at, at the three hangars. On the south end of the three hangars, were six metal buildings. They called them Butler buildings because that was the manufacturer. And they were 80 by 120 foot buildings. We had a roll up, big roll up door on north and south end. And hangar, or building 13 was my father's building. And it was just off of the southwest corner of hangar number three. And we had a little 18 foot travel trailer that I lived in a lot of those, those years. I was kind of the, the watchdog as well as the labor. <laughs> <laughs> and so then you lived on the property? I actually lived on the air, airport property from 19, on and off from 1970 through 1989. And how was that experience? Oh, I have a lot of stories I could tell you about, <laughs> about the airport in that time period. And, but also my father had a lot, a lot of friends that had worked in aircraft and they were always stopping by the shop. I don't know how my dad ever got any work done because somebody was always stopping in to reminisce about the old, the old days. So I heard a lot of stories about the goings on there in, at the airport. I don't know, do you want to share any of them that well, stick out? Uh, <laughs> I don't know, I wouldn't know where to start. There was, there's so many. There was um, an aircraft company. We, we, did some, we did a lot of work for the mines, fabricating a lot of uh, pipe fitting and a lot of uh, stuff that had to be relined, uh, rubber line for the mines. We did a, a lot of work for the mines. We did a bit of work for Hughes, building missile handling carts and repairing plating uh, anodes and um, fabricating target collimators and stuff for, for, for the missiles and stuff at, at, at Hughes and a lot of the engineers and the people that worked there were old friends of my dad's and they were always stopping by <laughs> ticket boots and you know just talk talk shop so I like to say again I don't know how my dad ever got any work done because somebody was always stopping by to talk to him or, or pick his brains because he was kind of a, a master of everything he was electronics and uh, ham radio and he, when he was a teenager, he built TVs and radios and, you know, um, welding. He taught welding at uh, ABC, Tra ABC Trade School in, uh, it was located on 29th Street, Silver Lake. He went to school. He, we almost always had in the garage carport in, um, when we lived on Milton Street in Mission Manor, my dad was always rebuilding somebody's smashed up airplane fuselage. Mm -hmm. So I learned a lot about uh, aircraft sheet metal work. And we always had something, uh, instead of a car in the garage or the carport, we always had an airplane. So from the time I was a toddler, I was bucking rivets 
and you know, just worked on airplanes. And then when we, when my dad opened the shop at the airport, we did some aircraft work. Uh, one of our projects, we, we designed and built the fire bomber, the Bore 8 bomber um, fire dispersion, dispersion, that red clay water to, for putting out fire, mm -hmm. forest fires. We built uh, several of those in the DC-6s and DC-7s and uh, P2Vs. Uh, so, yeah, my dad was kind of a jack of all trades. And in hangar number three, right off the corner of our building, you asked for a story, um, was Saul Pess. He was a, a Turk, originally from Turkey, came to this country when he was a teenager, and uh, he was one hell of a nice guy. He was one of my favorite people in the world. And he was probably, it, when I was 18, 19, 20 years old, he was in his late 70s. And one of the things about him was he was, he was, uh, the mechanic for the, the gal that, Amelia Earhart. He was Amelia Earhart's mechanic. And he was the last person to touch her airplane when, it, when she left, departed on a big voyage. And Saul, so one of his major projects was he would go over to the scrapyards by, by DM and he would buy the old J33 engines, jet engines. They were a big pile of them. I mean, just maybe two or three hundred inches in a big pile. And they would he'd buy two or three of them, bring them back to the airport there in hangar number three, and he'd rebuild them and make them work. Because at that time, the FAA started a new regulation where they required all certified FAA schools, aircraft schools, if to be certified for jet engines, you had to have a running jet engine on the premises. So there was a big demand for the jet engines. So Saul took advantage of that and he built it, rebuilt the jet engines. And my part of it was I built the engine stands. That was my little project was building, designing and building engine stands. And the fun part of the story was he had an old 51 flatbed Chevy truck. And we would load the I would take the forklift and load the engine stand and the Jane engine on the back of the, his flatbed truck. And then we'd hitch up my dad's portable welder as a, a power source to start the engine. And then we would drive the truck on that apron on the south, south end of the hangars there on the, on the end of the runway, the short runway. And over there we would uh, fire up the jet engine and Saul would say, Jim, you want to drive? drive a truck powered by a jet engine. He's not too many people have driven jet engine 51 Chevy trucks. So then I, I just put it neutral and we'd kind of go in big circles around there on the ramp. So that's one of my claim to fame is I, one of the few people that have ever driven a jet powered 51 Chevy pickup truck or flatbed truck. <laughs> that's a great story. <laughs> and um, so it seems like a lot of the people that were in the three hangars uh, were building or constructing or doing something for the industries in Southside Tucson. Well, there was um, the landlord there was Tucson Aviation Center, and they rented the hangars. He and then from Tucson Airport Authority, so he was like the landlord for all the hangars and all the area around there. And then he sublet it to like my father and the other companies around there. But there was a lot of companies that came and went. On the, on the buildings like my father's buildings, there was uh, Air Crane that uh, had the uh, helicopters that they used for transporting big transformers on mountains and, you know, Air Crane. And there was a couple of maintenance places. And the, the propeller shop was right across the, from, uh, from our shop. And the propeller shop, the owner and his son and now his grandson, um, my father had worked with him aircraft before I was born. So we were real close with the propeller shop. And the, the grandson from the propeller shop was one of my best friends that I grew up with. So there was a lot of connections between the propeller shop, Warner Propeller, and Austin Fabricators. That's neat. And then uh, is there any other companies that stick out? 
that were that were there in the three hangers area? Uh, hanger Duradine, the hose manufacturer, mm -hmm. they started in the first the north half of hangar number one, and they manufactured big hoses, small, medium, and big hoses. Most of their hoses were um, for government use, so everything had to be mill, mill spec. And they uh, had a big, uh, big braiders that put the steel and cloth braid on the, on the hoses. And they had to have mandrels, the, so the rubber hoses had to be made on mandrels, like a mold or an internal mold. And that was one of the specialties we did at my dad's shop was building those mandrels. And of course, my dad's shop was on the opposite end of the hangars from where Duradine was on the north end of Hangar 1. And the, it was humorous. I, I looked for some picture of this, but I couldn't find any. But every one of those big mandrels that were 100, sometimes 125 feet long, they had to be carried by men. And they would sneak or, snake around the corner. And so there would be 15, 20 men carrying these mandrels on their shoulders. And it looked like a big centipede going around the building. <laughs> So they, they carried them from my dad's shop to the other four, far corner of the, where Duradine was located. And uh, so now we're going to talk a little bit about the contamination. So I imagine that during this time, not a lot of people were seeing any signs or any impact of the contamination that was occurring all throughout these industries. Well, in those days, they didn't know what contamination was. I mean, it was, you know, there was, it wasn't known. It was unknown. And they didn't do it deliberately. They just did it as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that early pollution was just accidental, unintentional. And years later, technology caught up and you know, we discovered that some of those contaminants were carcinogenic or, or hazardous. So when did you first hear about the contamination and any related health impacts that were associated with the Superfund site? Mainly when Jane Kay, um, her articles came out in the paper. Now I had a couple friends that, one friend that worked at the Tucson Water Lab, Ken Herway, and there was, and Frank Brooks, who was at that time the director of Tucson Water, was a very good friend of my dad's. And he was one of those guys that stopped by the shop all the time to talk with my dad. So I was fr quite familiar with Frank Brooks at Tucson Water and uh, this friend of mine that worked at the, at the labs. And there was a time when the guys in the lab were saying, we've got a, a problem around the airport. There's a lot of people complaining about their water, but we, we need a, mass, a gas chromograph mass spectrometer an expensive piece of machinery that they didn't have to really ad accurately test. And Ken said, you know, Frank Brooks stops by your shop. Can you drop a little hint that we need one? Because if I ask for one, I know I won't get it because it's a couple hundred thousand dollar unit. So I kind of put the bug in Frank's ear a couple of times and finally he got the guys the the instrument that they needed, this expensive test instrument. And that's about the time that they found the, or just, you know, isolated and determined it was TCE, was the main contaminant. And then a year or so later, the, a couple years later, the Jane K stories came out in the paper. And the interest, interesting thing about the Jane K series of stories that appeared in the paper were, was that everybody that was interviewed and that was affected by the pollution I either went to school with or neighbors or friends. So that was the ironic thing was that every article that Jane K wrote, I knew the person that the story was about. And did that make you become interested in becoming involved in the issue? Uh, beca I became aware of it, but uh, kind of from a distance. Um, now, when I worked at Duradine, we, they used well, I went to work at Duradine on and off over the years. Part-time, at first I started off there as a contract welder, um, manufacturer, builder, 
building build tables when they were expanding their production line. And I was kind of a contract, working on, you know, subcontracting to them. And I worked hand in hand with their maintenance department. And they used, in the production of the hoses, they used a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of TCE. Just north of the hangars, they had a, an area where they stored the 55-gallon drums of their chemicals for, for, for the rubber and, and everything had to be clean. So, and TCE is a really good cleaner and it evaporates easily and it doesn't leave any residue behind. So they used a lot of TCE. And what did they do when it became dirty and kind of, you know, they needed fresh TCE? They would just, on the end of each build table, they usually had a, a metal canister where you could dip your rag in and get TCE or pour it out on the hose. So I'd say they probably went through a 55-gallon drum of TCE every month practically. And being associated with the maintenance crew, we had the forklift, and we, we you know, like I say, we probably went out and picked up a 55-gallon drum every month or two. And then they had these big braider, braider decks that braided the, the fabric over the hoses. And those bobbins and needed to be cleaned, very clean. And we used to dip them in the TCE tank, solvent tank. That was probably, probably about a 150, 200 gallon tank. And about once a year, it would become pretty much saturated with oils and debris. And when we disposed of it, we just take it over there to the, the drain and dump it with the forklift. And then go put two more barrels of TC in there about once, about once a year. And it just went underground. I mean, that's just, we didn't know that we were doing a bad thing. And that was, from what I understand, that kind of that um, system just took everybody's like contaminants, right? From what I there understand? was a series of going back to when the hangars were built. Oh, uh, back to the building of the hangars. Um, we going backwards in time wise. Um, one of the customers at my dad's shop was Hal Ashton. We built some dump trucks for Hal Hal Ashton, Ashton Construction Company. And he would come by the shop and visit. And he, ex he said that when he was a teenager in 1940-ish, he worked on the building of the hangars. And he said they would bring in everything on, most, most of the uh, materials were prefab outside, you know, probably in California. And they were brought in on rail railroad flat cars, flatbeds. And the, there was a little spur between the railroad tracks and the hangars where they would pull up the railroad flat cars and then unload everything with cranes and, and forklifts and then start building those hangars. And he said that was quite a project. And you know, that just about all of Tucson was employed at the, building those hangars. And the other thing, he, curious thing he had to say was, on the side of A Mountain, there's a big hole on the north, on the east, east northeast corner at uh, on Silver Bell Road there, or not Silver Bell, but uh, Mission Road where it curves around. There's a big hole, and that was where the quarry was and the cement batch plants where they mixed the cement to pave the, the runways and the area around the hangars. And he said that those cement trucks ran 24 hours a day from A Mountain to the airport, pouring cement. And he said that cement is some of the hardest cement he's ever had to deal with. And I could vouch for that, because when I worked at Duradyne, we dug up uh, some more drains. We added some drains. We had to saw and jackhammer by hand that concrete. And it was run between 10 and 12 inches thick right there at the hangars. And we, we did it by hand for a couple of weeks and then finally said, you guys are too slow. So they brought in a big backhoe with the automatic uh, jackhammer, the huge jackhammer. And they used the backhoe with a jackhammer and their big digging scoop to, to do what we were taking too long to do by hand. Wow, that's very interesting. And then at the hangars, there was, there was a series of 
trenches, drainage trenches for the runoff. And over the years, um, the metal grates the, from forklifts and big trucks running over them, they got bent up and damaged. So about 1970, there was a south of the uh, building 18, which my dad's building was 13, there was 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18 was at the far, at the corner, of the southeast corner of Hangar 1. There was a big mountain of those grates. And so they pulled up the old grates and then they, a lot of, most of the trenches they filled in with concrete. And those were the trenches that were taking all the Those waste. were the trenches where everybody just dumped their waste in. Okay. And so when did you become involved in the community activities revolving the Superfund site? Well, when, uh, remember I said that Frank Brooks, Tucson Water Director, was a, a friend of my dad's and he frequently stopped by the shop to talk to my dad. When the Superfund first got going, the, res the settling parties of which Tucson Water was one of the, or Tucson, city of Tucson, was one of the uh, settling parties, responsible, potential responsible parties, uh, along with uh, Hughes and Donald Douglas and the other um, West Cap and the other places that hit around there that historically had polluted. And Frank came by the shop one day, and I believe he had uh, city manager Joel Valdez with him, who was also a friend of my dad's. And he said that they're starting up, uh, the EPA Superfund was starting to take action, and they needed a community advisory committee. They need people from the neighborhood, or from the area of the community, to work on it, on, to be on this committee. And it was required. And Frank thought he could talk my dad into being on the committee because my dad had a lot of the history of the area and you know, lived there, worked there, and had his family there. So my dad says, Frank, I said, I, I'm, I live at this business all the time. He said, I'm too busy to take time out. And he said, I'm here you know, 18 hours a day. And he said, uh, you need some younger blood out there. And he pointed down the, you know, the shop where I was working. He said, he needs some younger blood on the committee. So that's when he called me up there and Frank asked me if I would be on the committee. And I said, sure. So a couple weeks later, I got a, a nice letter from Frank and uh, Mayor Murphy requested me to be their recommended uh, person on the committee. And was this the TC subcommittee or was this the Unified Community Advisory Board? Well, before there was a, um, the first committee was referred to as um, Community Advisory Group, Tucson Airport Area Superfund Community Advisory Group. And it was made up of 10 people. And I was one of the 10. And then we started having the community meetings. And the first meetings were at El, uh, El Pueblo Center, which had just was brand new at that time, just, just built at the corner of uh, Irvington and Nogales Highway. And of course, there was all the lawsuits about the da people that were damaged after the Jane K stories, everybody got involved and there was the Tucson uh, Committee for uh, Environmental, Tucsonans for Environmental um, Cleanup or TEC -E was the, the initials. And they became active and there was all the lawsuits flying left and right. And there was a, a lot of injured and damaged people, a lot of angry people. And like I say, there was a lot of lawsuits and it was in the paper all the time. And when we had our first meeting in November of 1986 at El Pueblo Center, it was the atmosphere of a lynch mob outside. The only thing missing were the pitchforks and the torches. There was a lot, we, there was far too many people to fit inside the, the meeting room. So there was probably a hundred people outside with banners and chanting and you know. And so the meeting was kind of spooky. It was kind of a scary meeting because there was a lot of angry people. And they had extra police and there was extra security inside and outside. And we had 
meetings every month. And after about two months of this, um, at bad atmosphere, I finally realized that the 10 of us, of the 10 of us that were on that committee, I was the only one that was born, either born, raised, school, living, working in the affected area. Everybody else on the committee was from out of town, far side of town, you know, far north, far east. And you know, I was the only one. And I got, got to thinking, this mix and piece here, we need to get more community members. It's supposed to be a community advisory group, but I was the one person from the community. So I made a suggestion that we get some more community people. So that's when we added about five or six people from, from the community. And a lot of those were the activists. And after we did that, it settled down and got peaceful and we could get some work done. And then can I ask you, do you remember the, some of the original, these original 10 people who they were? You know, I, I, I don't remember names. There was one, uh, no, I, I'd rather not guess, uh, you know. It's been a long, it was 1986. Okay. <laughs> and then do you remember the five uh, people that were added from the community? I believe we had uh, Rose Augustine, uh, Saul Blackman, Myra, Jones, I think. Myra Jones yeah. and a couple others. You know, I think there were a total there was five and then six. Uh, and over the course of the year or two, that we would add one or two more, one or two more every now and then. So I think we eventually we ended up with about 20 people on the committee. And then uh, you were mentioning that at that time in the community, just people were discovering what was going on. There was this Tucsonans for a Clean Environment. There that's, was a lawsuit. That's, mm -hmm and different things. Um, was there any other thing that you want to add that was happening at the community level? Oh, I just don't. When I really became aware that at about the second, we had meetings every month. At that second meeting, after the meeting, I was out front talking to one of the activists, so-called activist uh, participants, and it was Rose Augustine. And when I lived on Mission Manor Street on Milton, you know, in Milton, Milton Street in Mission Manor, uh, a neighbor, Rose was a neighbor. And so I was asking her, you know, how she was doing, how were her kids, and I went to school with, went to school with her kids. And she was asking how my family was. And um, one of her people came up and whispered, whispered in her ear something and, and walked away. And, uh, and she kind of laughed and I said, well, what's so funny? She said, they told me not to talk to you because you were one of them, you know, the enemy. So once we got them on the committee, everything, we got some work done, you know, it became peaceful. So that was, a, that was an important step. So it's basically getting all the different uh, community activists, like you said, and then different people. Letting the community to... own it. Until we got more immediate community people on the, on the committee, uh, it, it was, it was hectic. And then I know that from this group, then I think you mentioned to me that uh, how long did this group function? And it, did that become the Unified Community Advisory Board? Well, or? we started in November. The first meeting was November of 86. Mm -hmm. And our goal was, and here's the paper, here's the feasibility study groundwater remediation in the Tucson airport area. This is the preliminary final engineering report. And it came out in February of 88. And it pretty sums up everything we did that first year was researching the, all the different uh, types of different ways we're going to go about remedi doing the remediation of the, the cleanup. And that's what we covered the first year, year and a half. And this was um, the summary of it. And so a lot of the information from that time period is in this, this book here. For, and I use go, go back for reference in it because it's, I reviewed it here recently. As you can see, it's fairly thick. So I've had uh, put tags on the relevant, important articles. And so this was your first task is just to focus on the remediation. Part. How we were going to do it. We had a lot of options and uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? 
routes that we could take, you know, there was, the first route was no treatment at all. And then this, one of the routes was, or methods was at each wellhead. And one of the, cons one of the problems with putting um, treatment at each wellhead, because a lot of those wells, the polluted wells, were right next to residences and stores and people. And we didn't, there was the problem of hazard to the community from the cleanup, you know, putting TCE in the air, you know, right next to houses and schools. So we decided, uh, long story short, we decided to go with a central plant with the air strippers. And that's the Tucson Airport Remedial Project. That's the TARP, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And one other thing was... From the get-go, a lot of us, myself included, on the committee, we pictured the tar plant being located at the Tucson airport area, where the heart of the pollution was, right, you know, right a stone's throw from where the most polluted wells were, the well at Sunnyside School, the well at Elvira, or El Vado, um, and where the, the heart of the plume was, most of the, and we wanted to go with one central plant. And there was only one logical location, and that was that area on the end of the runway, south of Valencia, north of Medina Road, east uh, with uh, Nogales Highway and the railroad tracks on the west side and Park Avenue on the east side. And there was a big desert area there next to the uh, I guess the Martin Reservoir is the name of Martin Reservoir. And it was a perfect location. And it, and it could handle, like I say, they called it a central plant. And it could handle from the Air National Guard pollution. And it could even handle the uh, pollution from Plume B. And it could handle West Cap and a Tucson, uh, our Texas instrument, that area, with one plant. And of course, Hughes had already started their own construction south of Los Reales. So the Tucson airport area was basically, on the south was bordered by Los Reales, on the north, Ajo, Ajo Way, and on the east country club was Country Club, and on the west boundary of the area was Santa Cruz River. So the heart of the plume was right there at the airport. And I always, and several of us, other people assumed that the tar plant was going to go right there next to Martin Reservoir. Because one another reason was uh, having a, a safety, a public safety buffer zone around the plant was an important consideration due to chemicals and the TCE evaporating into the air. Because that's what the, the tar plant did is it sprinkled the water at the top of the towers down through a medium of little balls and then they had a fan blowing air up to evaporate the TCE to evaporate it and clean the water. That's how they operated. And there was a potential for TCE going into the atmosphere. And what made that area ideal, in my mind, was the fact that a couple years earlier, they had blocked off Medina Road on where it went, where it connected with Park Avenue on the end of the runway around that Martin Reservoir. And that eliminated about 90% of the traffic through the area. And then they had, the state of Arizona bought up Sunnyside Schools on the corner of Valencia and Nogales Highway and the administration building, the maintenance shops and the bus shops, and they closed the school. And then on the corner of Valencia and Nogales Highway was the Shell Station and a couple of businesses on Nogales Highway. And then on Valencia, there was Tiny Use Hitch and Post Cafe and a couple of garages and, and some residences. Well, the state bought up all that land for probably a third to a half mile around that area. And they demolished everything. You know, they, they tore the buildings down and they kind of sanitized that whole area. So it was prime area for the stripping towers. And then when the, Mal the Malcolm Perney consultants uh, announced that they were going to put the tarp plant way up at the north end of the plume where the, where the water was is nearly contaminated and they were going to 
located at uh, what was then called water plant number two, the old water plant number two, which on the north, bordered on the north of by Mission, uh, Michigan Street, on the south by Irvington, on the, the west by Santa Cruz River, and by the freeway on the, the east side. And I asked the guys at Malcolm Perny, why would they put it there? It's more, you know, it makes more sense to put it at the airport where they could handle one central plant. We called it a central plant, but now it wasn't a central plant. It was way out in the boonies. So now, and they said, well, the city of Tucson was tasked by the EPA. Their task as were, were Hughes and the other pollutants, polluters, responsible parties, as they call them, provided money. The city of Tucson's task or duty was to provide the site and maintenance for the, the duration of the cleanup. So the city of Tucson, even though they owned the land at, around Martin Reservoir, at the end of the aircraft uh, runway, they owned that land. They also owned water plant number two. And for some reason, they insisted on the tarp plants going to water plant number two. So that was one of my big regrets is that I didn't raise a bigger stink about putting it at the airport and having a true central plant. Now we have the tarp plant up north on the plume, and now we have the treatment plant at the three hangars, the vapor phase extraction, and we have the cleanup uh, plant at Air National Guard. We've got the cleanup plant over uh, at the nearby at, at the uh, West Cap and Texas Instruments, and all of that could have been handled by one plant, one true central plant located by Martin Reservoir. And the community advisory group that you mentioned, were they meeting with the United States Environmental Protection Agency or government? The EPA was, their task was to facilitate all the responsible parties and the, the city, county, and state uh, entities that were involved in environmental quality and, and the feds. And EPA, persons from the EPA facilitated the meetings. And at first we had the meetings well, every month. We had meetings every month. And the first at, uh, facilitator from the EPA was uh, Dan Opolsky. And he was there maybe five or six years. And then a Craig Cooper did the next five or six years. And then we, uh, around 1994 was when they started building the, the TARP plant. And is that, did you ever then become involved in the Unified Community oh, okay. Advisory I Board? Was, you're taking me back to, back on target here. Uh, once we, once the TARP plant went up and took effect in 94, and went online, we kind of figured, those of us on, on the committee, we figured, well, our job's done. You know, we spent from, you know, from 86 through 94, working every month to get the plant going, and once the plant went up and it was online, we thought we were done. And we were ready to call it quits. And the EPA said, no, no, no. During the whole, the, uh, the EPA Superfund requires community participation throughout the whole life of the, the cleanup. So that's when they started the UCAB in 95. They started the community advisor group changed its name to UCAB in 95. So that's the link between community advisory group and UCAB. And I have a question. Uh, did you ever hear about a TC subcommittee that was headed by Lorraine Lee? I, it was one of the, well, the, that was a Tucson Environmental uh, Coalition. Okay. And, uh, yeah, I, I knew Lor Lorraine, but they were one of the uh, parties that were involved in the lawsuit, in the lawsuit. Okay. And um, can you remember how... Uh, it seemed like you collaborated a lot with the United States Environmental Protection Agency and then other of the responsible parties as part of this community advisory group, which then became the Unified Community Advisory Board. 
Is became that UCAB. Today, it's, it's, the group is called UCAB, and it was, it's required to be in existence until it's cleaned up. And getting to the cleanup time, back in the 80s, um, they were, the hydrologists and the, the engineers estimated, they told the community that it would probably take at least 30 years to, to eliminate the TCE contamination down, down to safe levels. Mm -hmm. But off the record, they basically said it would take at least 100 years. That was off the record. And they said, our great-grandchildren will be cleaning this up. And, and it's... And that's kind of proven, proven yeah. to be. Uh, when, when the tar plant first started up, they estimated it would run till 2025, I believe, 30-some uh, years. And then uh, can you, so then uh, the first, you finished the TARP plant, how you said it went online in 1994, then UCAB was uh, official in 1995. Correct. So what was the next thing that you worked on after this? Well, actually when, uh, in, when the TARP plant went up and they started UCAB, I kind of dropped out. Okay. I had a family and you know, I had work to, I'd spent, quite a few years every month working on paperwork. So I, I needed a break. But I still get the, the flyers and I still uh, go to some of the meetings, the community meetings. I keep in touch. Mm -hmm. I keep an eye on everything, making sure they're behaving. Yeah, and you also mentioned to me that you moved uh, to an area that was impacted by the construction of the tarp. They, I don't that, know okay, I, I left that out. I didn't go there yet. Uh, when I, the, my first house that I bought was in the 200 block of Santa Maria Street in Mission Manor. And that was 83, I bought that house. And in 91, I moved to Michigan Street to a, a, a big, a much bigger house on a much bigger acre, acre and a half lot. The previous owner had built a beautiful custom house, and they had he'd had uh, racehorses, and so there were stables and outbuildings, and it was it was a beautiful place. And it happened to be located on Michigan Street, which was just north of the tarp plant, where the tarp plant was going to go. Because I bought that house in '91, and '94 is when the tarp plant started up. So. That neighborhood, which, which was West Lamar Neighborhood Association, of which they made me the president to begin with, of their neighborhood association, uh, when the neighborhood found out that that was going to be the location for the tarp plant, they were kind of up in arms. And I, I was called on the carpet because I didn't give them pre-warning that it was going to be a tarp plant there. And that affected the, the value of the houses because once the tarp plant went up, to buy or sell a house in that neighborhood, you had to have a statement signed stating that you were letting the buyer know that there was a potential problem with the tarp plant being located right next to the, our street, our neighborhood. And going back now to the one reason they justified that location for the tar plant was because the nearest neighbor or residence to the plant, which was Mr. Wiles house on the end of Michigan Street by the river, was 676 meters. And they deemed that to be a safe distance for, for people. So that kind of became the de facto safety range for people to the tar plant. And when the city provided, and Going back to when I was, when they were coming into the neighborhood, and the neighborhood was kind of up in arms, we had three meetings in 1992 with the city of Tucson Water. And the first meeting was at Pueblo High School, and then a couple of months later, we had another meeting at my house on Michigan Street, and then a couple, later on, we had another meeting at, at my house on Michigan Street. And the uh, they assured the neighborhood that it was going to be safe to have the tar plant there, and they would make sure that it would be operate safe. And we had, the people in the neighborhood had a lot of questions. 
Uh, would there be harm to any potential harm to the workers at the plant, for example? And the city said, well, when the plant's running, it would be controlled off-site electronically or, you know, without people on site. And when people came in there to work on the plant, it would be shut down to make it safe. And then at that time, there was also the fire department, fire station 18, which is, uh, was located on that property, a temporary fire station. And the people were concerned about the fire station, the people, the firemen at the fire station being safe. They said, well, it just so happens that we're building a new fire station for, for the firemen, which is now at the corner of uh, Oak Tree, or uh, Drexel and Oak Tree, mid, in the middle of Midvale. So, that's, so after a couple of months, they built a, the fire station and the firemen moved out. And they assured us that that property would only be used in the future for storage of tanks and pipes and stuff. And they would never put anything in there. It would just be a remote storage area, you know, for safety reasons. So we acquiesced and we said, okay, we'll, we'll. Uh, and the other curious thing about those three meetings was at each of the meetings, the representative from Tucson Water, the director of Tucson Water, it was a different director. There was a lot of changes going on in Tucson Water at that time. And so it was no, obviously no longer Frank Brooks. No, he, he had retired years, years. I, probably about the, about the same time that I went on the committee in 86, Frank retired. Mm -hmm. And then they, when, when, the T, when the CAP came in, the Central uh, Arizona Canal came in, when that water came to town, there was a lot of trouble with the water, um, the pH difference in that CAP water dissolving the, the solids that were in 100-year-old pipelines and 50-year-old pipelines. And then they brought Frank out of retirement to kind of fix that issue. So he came out of retirement for about a year to fix that issue. And also at those first meetings, community meetings in 86 and 87, the people kept making comments about, well, the CAP water's coming in. We don't have to drink this darn polluted groundwater anymore. And I remember explaining to the people that, that CAP water is surface water. It's nasty. It has to be really cleaned up. So that was about the same time that the tarp plant went, well, a few years before the tarp plant went in, the CAP came in. Okay. And that, so that so was there was kind the of a 90s. cross over there. Okay. There was kind of a, yeah, all about the same time period. Okay. And um, so that's very interesting. And uh, so that's when uh, you established kind of the safety zone that you've talked about before. The, the, the public safety buffer zone was one of the primary criteria that was used to, to determine the, prop, well, the, uh, the method of cleanup that we were going to go to. That, that public safety buffer zone was one of the prime factors in determining what route we took to do the cleanup. And is it in that document then? It's all in here. It's in all in here. Document. Uh, and another thing that in, 90, in 1994, it's about the same time the tarp plant went up, there was a developer, two developers that wanted to, Home Depot wanted to put in a, a store at that, in that area on Irvington. There was one developer on the south, and there was one developer that wanted to develop north of Irvington, which was plant number two, where they, the tarp plant was. And the developer, the north developer, went to all the neighborhood associations and he was trying to sell that location for the Home Depot, which did eventually go on the south to the south developer where it is today. The, what, that was the start of the Spectrum Center. And the north developer came to, he went to the Sunnyside Neighborhood Association and he sold them on the idea and they signed up on his idea. He went to Elvira Neighborhood Association, they signed up on it. He went to Midvale and they, they were all rah, rah, rah behind him putting up the Home Depot north of Irvington Road at, at water plant number two. And he came to West Lamar and the people in West Lamar said, no, 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 you can't put it there because we had three meetings with, our, with the water, Tucson Water, and they explained that that area would never be used for anything that would uh, potentially harm community. 
it was, they, you know, my neighborhood association said, you can't build it there. And so we were the only ones that really knew, because we were the only ones, neighborhood association, that had the meetings with Tucson Water in the course of 1992. And of course, me being the, the president of the association, I had all the details and all the, all the records. And so we told the developer, you can't do that. And he was really angry that we opposed his purchase of Tucson property there. And we kind of went round and round for a while. I kind of tried to buy us off, a little payola here and there, or, you know, a little a car and uh, do certain things for our neighborhood. And we just told him, well, you might be able to buy us off, but you can't buy the, the uh, EPA off. Everything is written in stone. There's a consent decree that keeps that area from being built on. And <clears throat> the developer looked at me and he says, Mr. Austin, you're going to regret the day you ever opposed me on this deal. So I took that as, as a serious threat. I took that as a threat. Well, eventually the, the Home Depot went on the south side and it has grown now to the the big spectrum center, you know, it's huge. It's a real benefit to the community. But there was a, a, chance, a time when they were trying, going to try and put it on water plant number two. Now we move forward. There was a time in, I say, early 2000s when there was another developer tried to go in there and, and buy that land from the city of Tucson. And it just so happened that one of the guys that was with the developer, he called me on the phone. It was an old friend of mine that I worked in the mine with this summer I got out of high school. And it was Peter Douglas. And he said, is this Jim Austin that used to work at Pima Mine? I said, is this Peter Douglas that used to work at Pima Mine? So <clears throat> I explained to him the, the whole situation. He says, okay, Jim, I'll have to tell my, my customer, my client that lands off, off limits. Then move a couple years further down the line and there's another developer that wants to wanted to go in there and purchase that land and if you drive down there today there's it's been purchased the city of tucson sold it to another developer and going back to when craig cooper was there in 94 uh, i have a, a whole series of 13 letters that the other responsible parties uh, wrote to the city of tucson advising against that sale in 94 to sell that property, water plant number two, around the tar plant. Now, I have 13 letters from the other responsible parties, um, the neighborhood associations, um, city, one city council person against it, uh, and a letter from the EPA, Craig Cooper, EPA, warning the city of Tucson, do not sell that property. And they didn't sell it. Because Craig Cooper, they said, they told, Mr. Cooper from the EPA that he didn't know what he was talking about. So he came in, he, he called me on the phone. I said, yeah, they're gonna sell it. I was at the city council meeting and they're planning on selling it. So he said, I'll be right there, Jim. He said, I'm make a special effort. We're gonna to come to town. I'm gonna to bring the legal team, the EPA legal team, and we're gonna sit down with uh, the city attorney's office and educate them about their role in the EPA and the Superfund cleanup, their responsibilities. And about a week later, I got a call from Craig and he said, it's all done, Jim, you'll never hear any more about this sale of the property. We got them straightened out. They know their responsibility and their liabilities. That was 94. Now, about a year, year and a half ago, the, the new developer wanted to go in there and with a wheelbarrow full of money, waving in front of the city council and buy that property, and they did. So I raised object, objections at the EPA, soup, at the community meetings, UCAB meetings, I said, you can't sell that property. And here's the problem. And Craig Cooper described this problem to me in 94 when he had to set them straight. He said, over the years, there's a new cast of characters enters the scene. He said, the, the potential responsible parties are all new people after about 10 years. There's new, new people come in there. The city council are all new people. The new mayor, 
all the response and the new people at the EPA. And he said, every so many years you have a new cast of characters and they aren't historically up on the history of what transpired before them. So the people that, he said, the people that are there today need to be re-educated to what is historical fact. So that's why I think your, your historic oral history project, I think, is pretty important mm -hmm. for and the history, for, his, for, for future, not history, the future. Yeah, and that's exactly why I was started. And that's what you're... Yeah, so thank you, yeah. So I gave several, I made several copies of those 13 letters advising against and warning about selling that property. I gave one to Yoli at the UCAB. I gave one to Mary from the EPA. I gave one to uh, a reporter from the newspaper and I, several others I handed out. And I think that when the EPA finally read through those letters and they read through the original consent decree, they, they realized that they messed up. I about said a bad word. They messed up and let the city sell that property, which was a violation of the uh, original consent decree. So what appears to me what they, they did to kind of CYA, they wrote up a new consent decree that took out the part about the public safety buffer that was a restriction in the original consent decree. And they kind of snuck under the dark of night, kind of snuck that new consent decree in and threw the old consent decree out or updated the old consent decree with the new consent decree. And what that did was allow them to sell that property. But the problem was that when they sold that, when the city sold that property to, to the developer, it was still a violation of the original consent decree. So there's still that issue that's kind of eating in my craw. Mm -hmm. and, and I was thinking about going legally like, to uh, press the issue. I was going to go to the Goldwater Institute and have them bring action against the EPA and the city of Tucson. And I just, I'm too busy, I don't have time. So, so I acquiesced, I just let it go, you know, but it still eats at my craw that they did that. And so what are, what is your most proudest, or what are you most proud of during your involvement or your contribution with the Tucson International Airport Area Superfund site? It wasn't my most proudest, I think it was my most regretful was that I did not press the issue of putting a tar plant at the Tucson airport area. And I let, and I didn't raise a, a big fuss about looking at way, way up, up the plume. And instead of having one central plant, which we wanted to do one central plant to save money, now they have the tar plant, which is no longer a central plant. They've got the vapor phase extraction at the three hangers. They've got the cleanup at uh, Tucson or the uh, Air National Guard. They've got a cleanup plant over at where West Cap and Tucson, Texas, or Texas Instrument was. So there's multiple cleanup facilities now. And we originally wanted one. And there was only one logical location. And that was at the airport. And that was my, my biggest regret. And how about an accomplishment? Can you dig and think of an accomplishment maybe at the community level? I don't know all of the work that you've done. No, just that I was uh, religiously or read all the, the every, every month it seemed like I got a stack of paperwork from the engineers and the consultants and that needed to be read and studied before the meeting. And I diligently read through that stack of papers and I have, I still have most of that paperwork and I have boxes and boxes and probably hundreds and hundreds of pounds of paperwork saved from that I had to read every month. And the disappointing thing was that when I would get to the next meeting, 
people that had gotten that paperwork. It was obviously they didn't read the paperwork because they were asking questions that the paperwork answered. So that was, if I had one positive thing to say about myself, I diligently studied my homework for the meetings. And what do you want others to know about your role with the TIA Superfund site or something that might not be well known? Since I'm a good hard worker and I don't think I ever missed a meeting in that, that time period. You know, I was diligent and did the best job I could do. Um, the one regret, well, in retrospect, looking back at it, when the committee, we were issued, or all the paperwork that we had to study and agree, agree to and ask questions about. <clears throat> I realize now, looking back at it, that we were basically a rubber stamp. They were just communicating to the, to the uh, community, here's what we're going to do. Do we get your rubber stamp? So that's, you know, that was kind of a disappointment to realize now, retrospectively, that we were essentially a rubber stamp. But they were required to get us involved, but they required us to rubber stamp what they were doing. So we weren't so much constructive as we were just an audience. Mm -hmm. And thinking back on your experience on the Superfund site, what would you recommend or like to see future generations learn from the experience, from this experience? Well, not to pollute. You know, if the pollution wasn't there in the first place, we wouldn't be, you know, trying to settle this problem. We wouldn't have the problem to, to fix. Mm -hmm. So if you don't make a problem in the first place, you won't have to fix a problem. But in those days, we were dumb. We were unaware that we were polluting. And how would you like the memory of your experience to be remembered? Just I was there and tried to do my part. And how do you think that the memory of the Superfund site and the contamination will be remembered? Well, like I said earlier, we'll probably be fixing this problem, remediation, for at least the next 100 years. And how do you keep up with the information on the site? I'm on the mailing list. Mm -hmm. like every, every month or every other month or they have meetings now every third month, mm -hmm. quarterly, and I, I get the updates, and I have since 1986. And when you were mentioning that you had to study and did, I guess, be diligent on getting, you know, catching up. My homework, up. my homework. Yeah. What much did the, um, the consultants or the government provide you easy to read material? Or were you reading the scientific, the, all the engineering material? Well, I kind of had an engineering background. When I retired here a couple years ago, I was a machine design engineer. And, uh, and did you attend any of the media, community meetings that talked about health studies in Southside Tucson? A lot of uh, the meeting time was, was covered by the Department of Health and you know, state and county. Uh, took up a, a lot of the meetings. Okay. And a lot of time at the meetings. Okay, so, so then they were participants at the meetings. And you know, there was a time when around 94, 95, 96, in that time period, at the El Pueblo Clinic, people that were involved in the area, uh, you know, living and growing up in school there, they were doing health assessments every six months or so. And I think I had two, three health assessments at the Ill Public Clinic, and then I never heard from them again. I don't know whatever happened to that, mm -hmm. that program. And do you feel that you or either your family was impacted by the contamination? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I, don't know, I don't think there's too many people that have physical exposure to C TCE more than me. When I worked at Duradyne, we were in it all. At the, we were cleaning with it all the time. When we were welding uh, storage racks, the old using the old mandrels, we would cut them up with a torch and cut them to size. And before we'd weld them, there would be silicon 
the mold release silicone on, on the, the tubing so that the rubber would release. And we had to clean that silicone off of the, the tubing to weld it because it, it was bad for the weld. And uh, it didn't weld very good, the silicone. It would be a perforate the welds. So we would have to use, we used the TCE that was on hand to wipe off all the, the silicone before we could weld the joint. And then if it didn't fully evaporate, if you didn't wait long enough for it to evaporate, the fumes, the welding fumes, the burning TCE was nasty stuff. I can, st I can still close my eyes and smell it. And it would, it was poisonous. Mm. And there was times at my dad's shop when we were building dump trucks. So at Durdine, I worked in TCE day in, day out, all day long. And that stuff would take the oils out of your skin and your hands and your skin would look like a lobster. I mean, it was, it was if you didn't wear gloves and I didn't wear gloves, you, you know, your hands would look, end up looking real nasty. And then at my dad's shop, we would build the dump trucks and at the end we had a hydraulic lift and I was the one that got to go up inside the doghouse at the top of the cylinder and bleed off the air when we installed a new system. And bleeding off the air, I, the, I'd always get a bath or a spray or a shower from the hydraulic oil. And so we just go, I just go across the street to the propeller shop and get a gallon uh, jug of, or can of TCE and go back to my dad's shop and strip down to my chonies and wash all that oil off and my hair and with the TCE. So I, I bathed, I bathed in TCE. And then Hughes in the center, in the south end of hangar number two, for a while, for several years, Hughes aircraft had a, uh, a salvage a storage and a, where they, they auctioned off and sold old equipment, tooling and stuff, with lathes, mills, and my father and I were always over there, you know, looking through to see what they had. We bought a few things there. And one of the items that I purchased for, I think it was $25, was a vapor degreaser. It was a big tank, probably four by six foot um, long, or long and wide, and about three feet deep. And it was a big tank. And it had a heater at the bottom and chilling ring at the top. And you put about 200 gallons of, or maybe 100 gallons of TCE in there, and then you heated it, and it went through your, your parts, and it cleaned all the oils and all the debris off of your parts, and then when the TCE evaporated up and hit the, the chilling coils, it condensed and then uh, gravity, gravity down and washed the part again. So it was a real efficient cleaning tank, but it used TCE, and I turned around the day after I paid $25 for it, I sold it to Duradine for $250. Yeah, I've heard of that piece of equipment before. That vapor degreaser. Mm -hmm. Very, very, man, if, you, if you've ever used one, it really is a good cleaner, but it used TCE. And do you have any advice that you have for state or federal governments that are overseeing the cleanup? Just be aware that that Every so many years, there's a change of the cast of characters involved. And you might think you know everything, but you don't if you don't know the history. And what education and community recom or co communication recommendations do you have for the new generation that's, that will be active at the community level at the Superfund site? Just stay active, keep your ears open, and uh, do your research. Mm -hmm. And so that re a lot of that research needs to be historical research. And well, things like this whole feasibility study, all the facts and figures are pretty much in here. And that was from February of 1988. And, and I've mentioned to new personnel or current personnel at Tucson Water, items that were in here, and 
none of them have ever read this. You know, I, I would bring up issues, and that could, uh, for example, when I brought up the issue of the public safety uh, uh, zone, the buffer zone, the public safety buffer zone. When I brought that up a couple of years ago at one of the UCAB meetings, the city of Tucson uh, personnel said, oh, well, we have that covered. Because the city of Tucson, the, the fire department, requires a 35-foot fire safety zone for access for the fire engines around the tar plant. So we, we've got that covered. We have 35 foot. I go, and I started laughing. I said, you don't get it. I said, the safety buffer zone is not to protect your plant from the public. It's to protect the public from your plant. So that's another example of, uh, as a new cast of characters come in there, the history gets overlooked and forgotten. They thought that that buffer zone was to protect the plant from the public, not public from the plant. Mm -hmm. And did your experience with the Superfund site change your thinking about sources of contaminant or chemical exposure in your community or household after you worked on all of this? I guess I've still, you know, my own personal safety and con uh, concern about contaminants and stuff, I'm probably pretty lax with my, my own personal safety. But for family and friends, I'm diligent and work, you know, safety, safety first, but not so much on myself. Uh, I've never had any issues with, because I've been around TCE so much, I've never had any health issues. Um, I was never involved in any of the lawsuits for the damages done. Never collected a penny there. Uh, and I had a lot, a lot of friends and knew people that did receive the monies, but me and my family, we never t sought action. And my mother died of uh, cancer. My father died of cancer. So whether the TCE was involved, who knows? It's anybody's guess. Getting back to your other question about what would I like to see in the future was <clears throat> whenever that new cast of characters comes in, especially, especially city council, mayor, um, city water directors, uh, administrative staff at city water, it should be mandatory that they, they be issued one of these and have to read it mm -hmm. and know it. Because a lot of the people that are involved now, that new cast of characters I was telling you about at, at the, the city council, the mayor, and they don't know this information. And that's important for the future. Mm -hmm. And they just disregard it. And like I say, they would, when I would bring up issues in here, they would look at me like, you don't know what you're talking about. And I said, no, it's right here. And on page so-and-so, it's a 676-meter safety buffer zone. So yeah, I'd, I'd like to see <laughs> some of this paperwork or these old hi historical uh, facts issued and be required reading to the <laughs> city council, the mayor, and the city staff. Yeah, and I guess, yeah, with that, and that, that's why you attend the meetings, right? That new cast of characters. Uh -huh. And like I say, I'm, I'm kind of getting tired of when I bring up <laughs> historical issues that they look at me like, I don't think he knows what he's talking about. So I've had to get used to that attitude. But I think you keep them on your feet. I think that's why it's great to have the longevity of the Unified Community Advisory Board members or the public that attends and can right now, them. Right now, it, currently, the longest involved party that is on the UCAB mm -hmm. is Henry Vega. Because he, he might have been one of the, that first year in 86, 87, when we added the community members, I think Henry Vega was one of those that we added on to. So Henry Vega is one of the longest members. He dates back to the early 80s, or the mid, late 80s. And uh, I've asked him if he remembered some things from those, those time periods, and I don't think Henry has a very good memory. Mm -hmm. I don't either, but okay. I, at least I have the paperwork I can reflect back on.